this talk is called Engineering Nutrition. Um, I think probably a lot of us here are software engineers and uh, Googlers, so it makes sense to kind of, one of the higher level things is that I think the uh, the ways in which software engineers tend to solve problems tend to lend themselves well to scenarios when you don't necessarily understand all the details or you, you kind of have to know what you don't know because that's kind of the lives we live in as software engineers. So um, I, I kind of apply that approach to nutrition and I'm just hoping that uh, you all will find it interesting. Um, I kind of have to address this question first, like why I came here, stopped doing software. Maybe I was frustrated with working with other teams or whatever, but why am I here right now to discuss nutrition? Um, this was me in the year uh, 2000, like nice little, little skinny Nick. Um, but uh, starting by like the fourth grade, I started to gain weight rather quickly and it was above the expected like normal weight for uh, of growth for development. Um, and you know, it, didn't feel all that great. Like I had pants buttons flying off during elementary school, which is like a kind of a traumatizing experience. Um, my mom called the doctor and I was able to glean this gem off my medical records. It says, uh, mom doesn't know how much he weighs, says he is really big, <laughs> 2607. Um, that was really fun. And I got to go to my doctor and, and talk about all this stuff. By the time I was 21, I actually had a hypertension diagnosis from my pediatrician, um, which is usually you're not supposed to have hypertension as a, as a child. Um, this was as high as 158 over 83 on my right arm, systolic. Um, I kind of, I ate the correct way in that I avoided fatty foods like chips. Um, I would eat crackers instead of chips because they're leaner. I select leaner meats like turkey, um, used whole grain bread as much as I could. My mom always got the 1% low fat milk. You know, I had been shown this in, in, in elementary school and I knew what I was supposed to do. I knew that grains were the base of the food pyramid. I knew that that's what I had to eat. Um, you know, my mom would always, if she cooked beef, she would literally paper towel the grease off of it after even buying the leanest beef that was available in, in Whole Foods. Um, the one habit I did have was snacking. You know, it was usually on things like crackers. I did so kind of because I was hungry in between meals. Um, there was assuredly some aspects of addiction there, kind of roaming to the, the closet and whatnot. But I remember I, I didn't really feel full all that much. You know, I could eat a lot of like pizza and crackers and, and I'd still be hungry. Um, and I, I had a sweet tooth or a sugar addiction. And basically my doctor told me what, what you always get told, which is that I had to eat less and move more, so I did. Um, statistically, though, the rate of success for such interventions where you uh, exercise and restrict your eating are, are very low, especially in terms of the ability to main, maintain um, clinically significant weight loss, which is defined as like 5% of body weight or more over a 24-month period. Um, when I tried it, it basically produced malaise, fatigue, uh, and a constant background of hunger that was worse than I was used to experiencing. Um, and eventually, my resolve to kind of be in that constant state of hunger faded and, and my weight kind of returned to previous levels. Um, the whole ordeal of like having your mom call the doctor and having to go in, it, it kind of produced, and, and this is like me at like age 12, you know, I, I have this about a decade of a mental state, which I would kind of classify as an eating disorder. Um, you, you kind of associate eating and guilt. They're like one in one. Um, you have this kind of obsession with overeating and eating too much. And, and the key problem is that science confirms that this intervention is just not effective. Um, and given only this tool, which is eat less, move more, you know, what can we conclude when it fails to achieve our goals? Um, the only possible conclusion, if that is your framework, is that we, we or I am simply too weak, despite my best efforts, to uh, achieve lasting weight loss. And I'm reasonably certain that the majority of Americans who are overweight kind of feel similarly. Um, having come to a point where I've moved beyond this phase, I, I can now understand exactly how unhealthy it was um, to be constantly afraid of eating. You have to eat every day. And to feel that if I was full, I would need to pay for that indulgence with like subsequent meals or exercise. It has a lot of overlap with the medical diagnosis for bulimia. Um, but this is the mindset that, that calorie counting produces, yet it really was only effective in making me miserable. Um, the, the summer before my senior year of college uh, in 2014, my uncle, who's a doctor in Massachusetts, informed me that humans were not designed to eat grains. I was particularly devastated because like a baguette was like my lunch at that point in time. Um, but I, I guess my uncle had decided that he was a primary care doctor and I guess he decided the money wasn't good enough. So he went over into weight loss where all the money is right now in medicine. So, and he used something in his practice called a ketogenic diet. And um, basically I, I figured I'd go on Reddit and try it out. And uh, in about 134 days, I went from 200 pounds, which was basically borderline obesity to 160 pounds, which is like an ideal weight for someone uh, like a male of six foot. Yeah, literally. Oh, sorry, my bad. <laughs> can tell I put this together with great forethought. Oh my word. Oh, Yulia's there. Hello. Hello. Um, uh, so the interesting thing is that I'd been a tri-sport varsity athlete in high school, which um, 
oftentimes entailed very high intensity exercise for two hours, six to seven days a week. And never before had I been able to attain that. Hold on, how do I? Oh, it's got one over there. So we can all see Yulia and say hi to her. Um, never before had I been able to attain like that low level. In fact, at that point in time at 160 pounds, I was 10 pounds less than, than when I graduated from high school. Um, but that wasn't all that happened. You know, I started feeling almost like my body was working again. Like I, I had remembers it as a child, I would have energy and I would bound around and jump. And then it kind of started to, to fade and exercise became less fun. Um, and now, you know, at this point in time, I, I've resumed skipping down the halls and I'm sure I look like a complete goon when I do it. But I, I, there were other things too, like sinus headaches. I used to get them pretty regularly. They call them like holiday headaches when you eat too much sugar. Like I used to get those all the time and they went away. Um, I don't really get food coma so much anymore. And, and there was just a lot of um, changes that, that were pretty interesting to me. Um, Unfortunately, you know, with these experiments, you kind of go up and down. And, and this was what I looked like the day I joined Google about 18 months ago. Um, hopefully now I look a little bit better. You know, I look a little bit different. So one, one person actually told me I need to change my badge photo because I don't necessarily like my face has changed shape a little bit. But um, to be scientific about it during 2018, when I did this again, I actually didn't do any exercise at all while I tried the diet, um, maintaining my strictness. I, I had... It, you know, it's kind of a learning process. You have to go through understanding what works for you and what doesn't work for you and, and trying things and adding things. And it, there's a lot of experimentation that goes into it. But um, I resumed uh, lifting and exercising as of about March of this year. But it kind of I kind of resumed exercising once I felt that I wanted to and once I felt that it was enjoyable. But and interestingly, I, I, there's a truck that comes here called uh, Body Spec and they do DEXA scans. So I was able to go in and get like DEXA scans. And you can see this is uh, in March of last year. And this is, I think, about a month ago. And you can see that the red here means fat. And uh, you can see that there's some less here. Um, I kind of came to the conclusion that something was amiss because what I've been doing to achieve these results was entirely opposite to what my doctor had told me. Um, and it, it worked for me twice now. And so it, it kind of led me down a bit of a rabbit hole and a lot of reading to understand, to be able to reconcile that anomalous observation with, with what I had learned and known about. Um, so kind of every nutrition presentation has to start by explaining that there is an obesity crisis going on in America. Um, you can't really discuss nutrition at all without discussing the obesity crisis um, and discussing that we're at the point where the military is, is actually struggling to find and keep fit individuals. Um, and we all pretty much know this and we've been hearing about it for so long that it kind of seems like old news. Um, even within the last few years though, the, the problem is getting monotonically worse. Like this is just from 2011 to 2017. And if you look at the beginning here, is a lot of green. And as time goes on, they had to add this additional category here, greater than 35% obesity in 2013. Um, and I think it, we're kind of numb to it at this point in time, to be honest. I actually talked to a guy who was from a small Eastern European community where they didn't have obesity. And I asked him like what his reaction was like when he, he immigrated to the US. And I asked him what it was like when he landed in Dallas, Texas and saw the obesity rate. And he literally said that he started crying. Um, I think it's a it's just a very emotionally powerful thing to understand. We have problems that we have to work through, and I think we have to talk about this and have dialogue and, and put different options on the table to understand like what we can do to manage this. Um, the, the problem goes much worse, though. It, it, it doesn't stop at obesity. Um, we are having an epidemic of chronic disease in this country. And by chronic disease, I mean any disease that isn't obviously caused by an external pathogen. It kind of comes from within you. Um, these are kind of a set of them, there are more, but heart disease is probably the one that you hear the most about. Uh, stroke, which is kind of basically heart disease, diabetes, cancer, dementia, and even, even problems with mental health. I don't know if you know this, but we're having a, a crisis of mental health even in the um, uh, university system and whatnot. They're all talking a lot about this because the, the rate of, of mental health issues is increasing kind of dramatically. And the interesting thing is that these aren't independent. They seem to all come together uh, like some big kind of sad family. Uh, the, the term used to discuss this, it was coined in the 90s, is called metabolic syndrome. It's just the idea that there's a problem with your metabolism. Um, and it, they're all intercorrelated. You know, if you have diabetes, you're twice as likely to have many common cancers like liver, pancreatic, and endometrial cancer. Um, diabetics are more likely to get heart disease. Alzheimer's appears to be a symptom of diabetes. And even diseases that you wouldn't really even assume are associated kind of show up with a strong positive correlation with, with diabetes, like migraines, arthritis, and hypertension. Um, and like the cost of these diseases on our healthcare system is, is immense. I mean, at present, we spend the bulk of healthcare money managing and not curing chronic disease. And there's a simple reason. We really don't have any 
any manner of curing it. You just kind of have pills that you take indefinitely. These are things like cholesterol medications, blood pressure medications, and, and diabetes medications. They do not cure the disease, um, which makes them very profitable because patients kind of take them indefinitely. Um, I didn't even realize this, but I think a quarter of Americans have arthritis at this point in time. That's what they stated $140 billion of, of medical costs on arthritis alone. Um, and this was from the CDC's website, 90% of the nation's $3.3 trillion in annual healthcare expenditures are for people with chronic health conditions. Um, and I think beyond just the, the dollar cost, by cause of death and certainly by decline in your health and vitality, chronic disease is taking an indescribable toll on our civilization. Um, obviously, therefore, we want to know what causes it. And it's McDonald's, obviously. I'm, I'm just kidding, it's not McDonald's. Um, the first thing that people will usually say when you say the chronic disease is increasing is they'll say, oh, it's, it's simply because of lifespan and life expectancy improvements. Um, that's wrong, actually. Um, chronic disease are not a natural part of aging. Um, many believe that we observe them today because we eliminated infectious agents, which would normally have killed us at like 37 years of age or something like that before the diseases took hold. Um, so I kind of have to describe, describe a little bit about what life expectancy is. Um, we're kind of misinterpreting a little bit. So it's, it's the average number of years that you would live from birth. So the vertical axis here is percent of people in a population alive that were born. And this is number of years from birth. And at a certain point, everyone's dead and that more people die off as time goes on. Um, so a lifespan of 40 can actually mean that 50% of the people died uh, infant mortality right at birth and 50% of the people died at 80. Um, I don't know if you guys know, where has the greatest increase in life expectancy come from? Like which side of this graph? And it, it actually ends up being infant mortality. That's the place at which we saw the most gains in life expectancy. And th there haven't been as many gains in um, older people actually living longer. It's kind of, we like to think so because medical care is improving and everything. But it, it turns out that if you look at the data, the maximum lifespan, which is this kind of longest lived 10% of the population, hasn't changed that much over the past several centuries at least. And there have pretty much always been people who lived to what we would consider senior age. Um, so chronic disease is more describing like for these people, how healthy are they? Um, the other thing about this is that chronic disease is actually moving younger and younger in age brackets. So between 2000 and 2010, uh, stroke rates in young adults increased by 43.8%. And these are people that like normally in the prime of their life, you know, and it's not a survivorship bias trend. People are not suddenly living longer than 25 years of age. Um, likewise, type two diabetes used to be called adult onset diabetes, but they can't call it that anymore because kids are getting it now. Um, when you have a disease that appears kind of from nowhere uh, and it isn't infectious, a good hypothesis to test is that nutritional problems drive the disease. Um, for one, it's a very large variable. Um, and we know that kind of deficiencies or dietary metabolic incompatibilities can drive disease. So it's, it's a good thing to rule out. Um, we can start to look at that by looking at populations that have escaped chronic disease in the past. Um, there are a number of really fascinating works that aren't honestly referenced all that often these days. Uh, Weston Price is probably the one that you have to read if you're interested in this space, because he was a, a dentist in the early 19th century. And, and he they had observed at that time that the rate of tooth decay was dramatically increasing in Western populations. And he basically traveled the world with a camera in search of groups of people that did not have tooth decay. Um, and of note, he was able to find groups of people that lived pretty close together within like a one hour walking distance. So they, they're similar genetic population, similar common ancestry, um, but they had different diets and different rates of disease in the term of tooth decay. So he could literally go through and count the number of teeth that were decayed. Um, and these are some of the pictures he took and you can see the comparison between like a population that had access to certain foods and a population that didn't. And one of the things he noticed was that when the foods of Western civilization became available, that's when disease started to uh, appear. Um, Diabetes was actually diagnosed uh, as early as ancient Egypt. This is the Ebers Papyrus. It is the first document that they believe described diabetes, um, and it dates to about 1550 BC. Um, the epidemic was first noticed by two scientists or, or doctors named Elliot Joslin and Reginald Fitz, and they presented, uh, basically they'd gone through medical records in the late 1800s and determined that, that the number of people reporting to Mass General Hospital had increased basically exponentially over the past 74 years. Um, at the time, they didn't necessarily identify that this was an epidemic. They just thought people were kind of coming in more readily when they developed the horrifying symptoms. But it, as, as time has kind of told, 
they were actually witnessing the beginning of an epidemic in the 1800s, whereas like the early 1800s, it was unusual for them to see one diabetic a year, but by the end they were getting a couple a month. Um, and by 2017, the, the 2017 CDC statistics say that 73.5% of seniors in the US have diabetes or prediabetes. Um, I don't think, like, this number doesn't get talked about a lot, of, um, and I think that that's a problem. Um, though doctors in ancient Egypt recorded heart disease, there were actually very few, if any, case reports of, it, uh, of the characteristic symptoms of heart disease uh, uh, in the 1800s in the US. This is kind of notable because the symptoms of heart disease are very distinctive. Someone has pain in their chest and then an otherwise healthy male drops dead. That's something that doctors tend to observe. But uh, there were a few discussions of these in Nina Teicholt's book, which I will also recommend on the follow-up sources. But basically, they were unable to find uh, a lot of uh, case reports on heart abnormalities in the medical records in the mid-1800s. And an authoritative textbook in 1915 had actually no mention of coronary thrombosis, which is a, a heart attack. Um, <clears throat> The uh, likewise cancer, like everyone agrees that cancer has environmental roots. The only question is kind of which part of the environment, carcinogens or lifestyle. Uh, there were two uh, researchers who published kind of a seminal work in the early 1980s, and they, they concluded basically that 75 to 80 percent of cancers were probably environmental driven. Um, unfortunately, they concluded at the time that it was probably dietary abnormalities or changes in the diet that were probably responsible for a majority, whereas uh, the assumption at the time was actually that everything, when it comes to cancer, behaved like the idea of a carcinogen. Like We all know the idea of a carcinogen. It's some component that kind of mutates your DNA and causes cancer, but the assumptions were made that food acted upon cancer in the same way. And that is why we kind of believe today, like you don't actually hear all that much about nutrition, even though it's been observed that there were, you know, substantial differences in westernized versus non-westernized populations and, and along certain dietary lines for cancer rates. Um, and likewise, hypertension is another one of those examples. As soon as they developed the sphygmo manometer, which is my favorite word, it, uh, they went basically through all different countries trying to find people who had hypertension. And it turned out that in non-westernized countries, the, the blood pressure declined with age. They actually went down or stayed the same. Whereas in almost every Western country, like the United States uh, and affluent countries, the blood pressure went up as people aged almost universally. Um, so, Synthesizing this all, we kind of have some good news and some bad news. Uh, on the plus side, it looks like by lifestyle modification, there are ways that we can avoid and ameliorate chronic disease. That's definitely a positive, but on the, on the negative side, it seems like our lifestyle is driving a massive epidemic of chronic disease. Um, so you kind of have to start digging at it. If they all come together, we have to talk about like what's common about chronic disease and, and in what way can we try and relate it and, and work out from there? Um, as I mentioned, 73.5% of US seniors have diabetes or prediabetes. That's an interesting place to start because this is a, an affliction that like, it, it's in the right place at the right time, if that makes sense. It's afflicting those that are near their life expectancy. Um, and if you expand the definition to include all kind of related um, metabolic dysfunction, um, the, the numbers uh, grows to 88%. So about approximately one out of eight people in the US general population are healthy by, by various metabolic tests. Um, so I have to kind of describe a little bit about what diabetes is. It's um, a disorder of carbohydrate metabolism. So you probably all know people in your life that are diabetic or have to prick their finger and measure their blood glucose, but um, diabetics struggle to properly handle and digest carbohydrates. So they end up with a lot of blood sugar piling up in their bloodstream. Um, there's kind of a key hormone that's responsible for orchestrating the digestion of carbohydrate, and it's called insulin. And basically, there's a kind of a deterioration that happens in someone's um, insulin response over time. Um, the, basically, what, what this graph is, it's uh, a lot of lines superimposed, but what happens is you feed someone a meal, and then you watch essentially how much hormone it takes to, to digest it. And what you can do is you can compare that over time. Um, and this is, this is from a, a seminal paper by uh, Joseph Kraft in 1975, but he basically grouped people and, and showed the association between worsening insulin, increasing insulin uh, action, and uh, diabetes development later in life. Um, so basically, you can use this insulin uh, metric to understand it's called insulin resistance is the term for it. And you can use this metric to understand someone's metabolic health. Um, so the interesting things happen when you start to try and apply 
that framework, if you apply like insulin resistance is the problem that is, is underlying diabetes. And you, you try to use that and measure that and see what disease rates look like. And I think this, this is called a, um, this particular study is a prospective cohort study. And what they do is they, they measure this blood metric, this insulin resistance, um, by just doing that integral over that time. And then they essentially uh, segregate people into tertiles based upon like low, medium, high by approximately a third, a third, a third. And then they count over the next 10 years how many bad things happen to people in each group. Um, and the crazy thing about this is they, they use this test. This isn't exactly what I described. It's a little more involved test, but it, it's along the same principle um, that people who had optimal insulin sensitivity had absolutely nothing bad happen to them in terms of clinical events. They use clinical events like a heart attack diagnosis, a diabetes diagnosis, a hypertension diagnosis, sort of things like that, or a stroke or things like that. And um, what you see here is kind of the, the better your, your insulin, the better your metabolic health, the fewer problems happen to you. These are all chronic disease diagnoses, right? Uh, the interesting thing is cholesterol didn't predict these events at all, which was kind of interesting. But uh, the other really interesting thing to consider is um, survivorship bias. So one of the key studies that people do a lot to understand aging and health are to look at centenarians because they represent a, a selection bias on the, the characteristics that keep us healthy over time. Um, and they, they did basically a similar test to this insulin area in uh, over here on the far left, you have adults, which are people who are like age, I think, 50 to 75. In the middle, you have people who are 75 to 100. And on the right, you have centenarians, which are 100 or more years old. And the interesting part about this is that the, the centenarians are as healthy as the adults. But in the middle here, there's a bit of a sojourn that goes down. And basically, the, the, the authors of this paper correctly called this out. This, this could be easily explained by a survival effect consisting of natural selection of subjects having a preserved glucose tolerance and insulin action. What that means is that the people below this line who are in this group, they all died before they got to being centenarians. Um, so taking these two things together, you can generate a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that something associated with diabetes or this core dysfunction in metabolism um, causes much of chronic disease. And if we can fix this problem, if we can understand how to treat this problem, we can ameliorate a lot of chronic disease without having to give everyone a separate pill for each thing, which is kind of how our, our medicine system works today. Um, obviously, we now have to look into how diet and chronic disease overlap. Um, there are a lot of different ways to get at this problem, but I think the, the core answer to the changes in our food consumption patterns are that humans evolved eating food, which would be kind of like these plants and animals and things. And today we've kind of switched to incorporate a lot of food-like substances, which are anything that didn't kind of obviously come from an animal or a plant, and you're not quite sure how it got to look like it is. Um, in particular, I think there, there are a lot of ways that you can talk about this. One of the things I think isn't talked about enough is, is the addiction aspect of these things over here. Uh, there's, a, there's a difference between like feeling hungry and a craving that literally drags you out of your apartment at like 2 a.m. for like Ben and Jerry's tonight dough. There's, there's, a, there's a distinction between those two things and there, that, that idea that we could be addicted to food and have a, an addiction loop within our brain isn't really discussed enough. Um, but one may observe that the, f the foods don't tend to associate with that addictive behavior as much as, as, as processed things like this do. Like, I don't know of anyone that's addicted to steak. I mean, I eat a lot of steak, but I'm not like addicted to it. Toby might disagree. Maybe I'm addicted to steak. Um, so we can de deduce that in, in principle, there's probably some aspect of the quality of food that's important to the human diet. Um, trying to, we, we kind of have to go through and, and develop a framework for placing things that we think are good versus things that are bad. Um, we can refine it as we go along, but we kind of have to have some method of, of figuring this out. Um, the easiest place to look for that is paleontology. Uh, today, we all pretty much eat very similar things. I mean, even if you go to poorer countries, a lot of the things they eat are, are food aid and other things that are shipped in um, from places like the US. So like white flour is pretty much universally, there are not very many humans today that do, do not eat white flour and sugar. Um, whereas at points in the past, there have definitely been, you know, white sugar didn't always used to be a thing, nor did uh, the material necessary to mill grain and things like that. So we want to kind of go through the 
the evidence to understand what changes happened with changes in food consumption and see if we can correlate them. Um, for instance, it's commonly known that the average height of uh, European males dropped considerably uh, after the last ice age melted with the changing climate patterns. Um, the, the theory from most of the scientists was that a, a, the reduction was influenced by global climate change and the adoption of agriculture. But what you kind of see is that, that Hunter-gatherers in the 30,000 year ago time span were actually taller on average than we were today, height being kind of a proxy for quality of nutrition. Um, there are uh, other studies that look into the kind of association with different diets. And the, the general conclusion of a lot of this evidence is that um, agriculture provided an increase in raw caloric production that enabled civilization. And I think that was very important because we wouldn't have had civilization without that. But the quality of the nutrition that we gleaned from it was somewhat inferior and chronic disease was produced was higher. Um, this is probably because humans haven't had enough time to adapt to it. If you look evolutionarily, like we spent a very long time being hunter gatherers. There were about 2 million years, give or take, that we spent kind of eating a hunter gatherer scavenger diet. Um, and we switched our diet uh, when we became agrarian to include a lot of these newer foods. And then in particular in the past century, um, we've accelerated a lot of these changes, processing and adulteration of the food. Um, and what we get is an epidemic of chronic disease. Um, the most interesting data point to talk about current nutrition policy, in my opinion, are studies of Egyptian mummies. And I'll tell you why. Um, Egyptians actually had rampant obesity and heart disease, despite a lack of video games. Um, their medical texts describe heart attacks in pretty reasonable detail, the, the death and the chest pain um, being called out in particular. The most interesting thing about this is that using a stable isotope analysis, we can actually determine the protein source for Egyptian mummies and determine what portion of it came from uh, agrarian sources like proteins in uh, grain or whatnot and what uh, proportions came from animal proteins. Uh, it's, they use a technique called stable isotope analysis, which looks at the relative concentration of nitrogen and it has to do with the, the adulteration of the, the ratio that happens during uh, metabolism. Um, but what we, what we find is that the Egyptian, uh, as they call it in this paper, which went through in, in great detail, was that ancient Egyptians most likely consumed less protein of animal origin than do modern humans. Uh, and they didn't have sugar, they didn't have much of any refined oil like we do today, um, but they did have stone ground wheat flour. The interesting thing is that that is exactly what the modern dietary recommendations would have us do. They would have us cut sugar and use whole grains to eat. I don't know whether they didn't read this paper or whatnot, but we kind of then have to get into the modern changes. Um, obviously, uh, the beginning of our obesity crisis today, as we think about it, dates to about 1980. Um, prior to that, obesity rates had held somewhat constant for, for a number of decades. Um, by total coincidence, uh, the dietary guidelines for Americans, which was the first point in time that uh, the government had taken a position on particular matters of nutrition, came out in 1980, which also coincides with the beginning of the obesity epidemic. Um, this was kind of kickstarted by the, the seminal work in this field uh, called the uh, Dietary Goals for the United States. This was uh, by a senator named George McGovern. And um, this basically ignited this hypothesis that you want grains over fat, like meat is bad, grains are better. Um, and the interesting thing was I actually pulled a second edition copy of this uh, and it had an additional forward added and it said, this is from the ranking minority member on the committee, it says, I have serious reservations about certain aspects of the report. I have become increasingly aware of a lack of consensus among nutrition scientists and other health professionals, which I thought was kind of interesting. But they basically, uh, this report was kind of enshrined by the USDA with the Dietary Guidelines for Americans in 1980, um, which was kind of the first point that the US government had actually taken a stance on nutrition besides just encouraging people to eat enough of the right things and kind of establishing RDAs. Um, basically, they, the recommendations at the time called for a decrease in saturated fat consumption, and they wanted you to replace it with grains, fruits, vegetables, and uh, industrially refined seed oils. Uh, you know these as vegetable oils, despite the fact that they're not from vegetables. Um, the problem was that the, the, the strength of the evidence behind that recommendation was not that strong. This is uh, Philip, Philip Handler, the president of the National Academy of Sciences at the time. He testified in Congress, what right has the federal government to propose that the American people conduct a vast nutritional experiment with themselves as subjects on the strength of so very little evidence that it will do them any good? Um, yeah, I could probably end my talk there, but um, the 
So you kind of have to unpack this a little bit and, and talk about what the core idea was that motivated these guidelines. Um, I actually have the, uh, the two respective Time magazines over there for talking about this whole fat heart disease thing for you to peruse at the end if you'd like. But the, the core tenet was uh, called the diet heart hypothesis. And it uh, argued that fat in the diet, particularly saturated fat, elevated cholesterol, particularly LDL or what they call bad cholesterol, which led to heart disease or if you talk to some people about it, it's the acceleration of heart disease. Um, and therefore, uh, the guidelines recommended that you uh, replace it with either polyunsaturated fat or carbohydrates. Um, if you look critically at this, you'll start to see a problem, which is that you can actually probably generate seven different hypotheses from these, depending upon which of the top or the bottom thing you choose in each. And then beyond that, when you say, you know, I want fat and I don't want that anymore, you have to replace that with something else. Um, so they kind of decompose into two different high-level hypotheses, which are that if you replace saturated fat, like your steak, with vegetable oil, uh, you'll re reduce death via reducing heart disease death. I guess that kind of makes sense. And the other hypothesis would be if you take saturated fat and you replace it with grain, you will reduce death overall via reducing heart disease death. Those are kind of the two hypotheses at a high level that you would get out of this, this kind of theory. Um, interestingly, it's not entirely clear which one at which time each is advocating. So if these are the dietary guidelines for Americans from 1980, and they are clearly saying, uh, they're basically advocating that you want to eat more complex carbohydrates and limit saturated fat, which is a trade-off one-to-one for carbohydrates and saturated fat. If you go on the Harvard School of Public Health's website today, they say the other. They say that eating polyunsaturated fats in place of saturated fats or, high, or highly refined carbohydrates reduces the problem. Um, you have to be very, very careful to make sure that if you're considering a hypothesis, you actually consider one hypothesis at a time and go through it and, and, and work through it directly rather than... Um, kind of jumping to whichever one. People like to jump in this field a little bit. I apologize, I'll have to do a little bit of a quick chemistry aside for you. I hope this doesn't bring back any like nightmares of AP chemistry tests or things like that. But this is uh, a saturated fatty acid. Um, a saturated fatty acid is straight in that every single one of its uh, carbon atoms is saturated with hydrogen. Um, when you have an unsaturated you, uh, fatty acid, you basically remove one of those hydrogen atoms and it results in a double bond here, but, and it results in a kink. Um, so there are many different types of these. Uh, they are grouped roughly by how many bonds are unsaturated. So this is a saturated, this is a mono unsaturated for one double bond. And if you had two, uh, it would be a poly unsaturated, which means like one or more. Uh, the top one is 16-O uh, or palmitic acid, which is a common saturated fat in steak. Um, but every fat that we have is made up of kind of a combination of these. So um, you have different fatty acids with different chemical properties. In general, like the more saturated a fat, uh, the, the, it will tend to be solid at room temperature and its melting point will be higher. So butter is mostly solid at room temperature because it has a higher proportion of saturated fat than olive oil. Um, importantly though, uh, butter is actually only 61% saturated fatty acids. The, the key word to, to Google here is fatty acid decomposition or composition, and it'll tell you what's in here. Um, so you'll recall that one half of this diet heart hypothesis, this heart disease hypothesis, was that saturated fat raises cholesterol. And if you look at this, it's going to start to get a little bit complex because there are actually seven different types of saturated fats in butter. Uh, do each of those saturated fats have a different effect on cholesterol? And the answer is yes. Um, fatty acid with chain lengths 18, which is stearic acid, and 10 or shorter are, are conclusively established to have no effect on cholesterol whatsoever. Um, 16, palmitic acid, has minimal effect. The two ones that have an effect are uh, 12 and 14. Those are the two primary ones, which are actually, um, as you'll see on the next slide, uh, a minority of steak and lard. So bacon and, uh, and steak both have a minority of the saturated fats that alter your cholesterol, whereas coconut oil actually has majority of the saturated fats that alter your cholesterol. Um, the other thing, it, it just... It, it becomes a mess very quickly because everyone says that olive oil is wonderful because it has tons of this oleic acid, which is a heart-healthy monounsaturated fat, whereas lard also has tons of that oleic acid. So what's the difference? Um, so, and the idea that cholesterol drives heart disease is, I think it's 
a drastic oversimplification. I don't really have the time to cover this in sufficient depth. Um, I'll try to do a separate talk on it if, if there's enough interest, but you can pretty safely conclude at this point that that hypothesis was wrong um, because heart disease begins before cholesterol accumulates. Um, this is just aggressive. So there are actually six different discrete types of atherosclerotic lesions. This is from a, a book called The Natural History of Coronary Atherosclerosis by Constantine Velikin, who was a, a renowned pathologist. And he groups these by kind of rough cause. So abnormal proliferation, abnormal coagulation, abnormal permeation. Um, and one of the quotes he has here, which I thought was particularly interesting, this is very like science speak, so I'll try to translate. You, you, if you have a thesaurus, medical texts actually become very comprehensible. But basically what this says is that the accumulation of cholesterol in heart disease does not associate with the beginning or the progression of heart disease. And moreover, when the cholesterol does accumulate at the end, other macromolecules, other large macromolecules in the blood accumulate at the same time. Historically, we developed the test to measure cholesterol first. So that was the first thing we noticed and thus that became the hypothesis. But, um, and the interesting thing is we actually have some experimental data on uh, one of the hypotheses abo above the um, Sydney Diet Heart Study. Um, in essence, it's, it's kind of a simple design. They, uh, this was done in the late 60s, early 70s in Australia. And you hand half the people in, in a group randomly uh, tons of safflower oil and special margarine designed to have low saturated fat. So to the best that they could, they tried to get a one-to-one -one substitution of whatever you were eating currently, which was presumed to be a higher saturated fat meat with a, a, a low saturated fat and high in polyunsaturated fat oil. Um, and then you basically count how many people die, right? It's pretty simple, a little bit gruesome. There was a problem though. Um, the people who got the substitution died 75% more often. Uh, and this was sufficient to reach the threshold of statistical significance, um, which poses a bit of a problem for a hypothesis if we expect a benefit and the mortality goes in the other direction. The other interesting thing was they forgot to publish the actual count of mortality for about 40 years after the study was concluded. I don't know exactly how that, and there's probably some historian that can go in and understand. In fact, no, no experiment has ever been able to show directly end to end that they can get a mortality benefit um, from a substitution like this. Um, and in general, the way that this works is that if you have a hypothesis and you throw a billion dollars at testing it and you can't prove it correct, it's wrong. That's kind of how this works in science. Like if a billion dollars is insufficient to, it's kind of a, a good principle. But to be fair, there are people who still will tell you that all these trials that I say didn't work were a success. And I have to explain to you a bit of the shenanigans that go on in nutrition for you to understand why I might argue this while they argue that. So um, it comes down to like what your hypothesis is. So when I said my hypothesis, I made it very clear that we actually need to prevent people from dying in order to consider our trial a success. And intuitively, you believe the same thing, right? You believe that if we fix heart disease, that we are going to result in fewer deaths overall, assuming that because a great way to explain this is if you look at just the ratio of deaths, if I give everyone in this room arsenic, I will substantially lessen the probability that you die of a heart attack. But that's not a victory for like some great new pill that cures heart disease, right? That's a poison. So you have to be very careful in constructing your hypotheses. So the, the major ways that they do this are surrogate and composite endpoints. Um, so a surrogate endpoint is described as um, anything that you wouldn't know was a problem unless your doctor told you it was. So it's not something that outwardly, like death is a very hard endpoint. You know if you were alive or not. Whereas like the amount of little molecules floating around in your blood is not a hard endpoint. Um, so the example of the surrogate endpoint is when they did that original Sydney diet heart study when people died more often. And at the end they published and they said, good news, this diet reduced everyone's cholesterol in their blood. So we're super sure everything's fine. Carry on with your lives. Um, you can probably see why it can be a little bit dangerous to start relying on intermediary endpoints like blood markers without clear established associations. Um, and a composite endpoint is kind of a neat statistical trick. I, I, you probably don't want to use this in your working life, but the example I have is this. Uh, you're on a team. Uh, picture this. Nobody got promoted. 10% got a raise. And you, the clever statisticians, say 100% of the team got promoted, got a raise, or breathed oxygen today. And what you have done is listing less impressive but uh, more likely things after the impressive sounding null and, and doing the union of those things. And this is, I'd love to tell you that this doesn't happen all the time in science. This is a 
from a trial of a, uh, a medication designed to treat uh, cardiovascular disease. And you'll notice right here in their primary endpoint, this is called a composite endpoint. What they said is the primary endpoint was first cardiovascular death and then a bunch of other things. And they said, we improved it. And then you go four lines down and you notice that cardiovascular death was completely null. And you have to be very careful about these things because there are smart people in pharmaceuticals that are gonna to try to convince you that their drug works really well. Um, and I will add out of fairness that because as I mentioned, there were seven hypotheses, for every hypothesis, it, it's not really possible to disprove every hypothesis. Basically, at one point they said cholesterol causes it, at one point they say it's LDL cholesterol, and then they say no, it's LDLP or ApoB or whatever. So there are kind of infinite number of these hypotheses, and it's not really possible to just, you know, some of them are actually mutually exclusive, like you can't actually have two of them be correct at the same time, but they all kind of fall into the same axiom. Um, so if you've worked in software or engineering, you're probably familiar with this law of unintended consequences. Um, you know, we release these guidelines and immediately everyone starts getting fatter, um, which was of course a coincidence. And then kind of more coincidence happened. We um, release these guidelines around the world and slowly other populations everywhere as these guidelines were released start getting fatter as well, a few years behind us to fight despite, you know, diverse cultural, environmental and socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, why did this happen? Well, the, um, the same people who, who originally released these guidelines have a great hypothesis ready to explain to you why it wasn't their fault. Uh, drum roll, please. The Bible. Um, <laughs> their idea is that exactly the point in time that the guidelines were released, the moral character of America in terms of its willpower, laziness, and gluttony took a nosedive, and the commensurate lack of self-control and lazing around on the couch and scarfing down too much food because our plates were too big or too blue, you know, kind of just did us in. And I, I satirize a bit. But the hypothesis is that conscious decisions around how much we eat and how much we exercise are the primary drivers of weight regulation. And some people actually take that to the literal reducto ad absurdum of that hypothesis and say, every other concern besides willpower in terms of those two vectors when it comes to weight management is simply irrelevant. Um, it's not very difficult to find observations that kind of contradict this hypothesis. There are plenty of people that are what we call TOFI, which are thin in the outside, fat on the inside. Uh, these are two people that are the same weight, but the amount of fat internal to them uh, varies substantially. And you actually can't tell by a BMI measurement. An observation that like weight gain is the problem and calories is the problem can't explain nuance like that. Um, and again, you'll remember that 88% of US adults are metabolically unhealthy. That's more people than are overweight, right? So how can we explain this hypothesis or this observation with the hypothesis that the key dysfunction is a caloric imbalance. It, it implies that something more nuanced is going on, right? That there's a, there's a quality problem of the food and that the quality of the food is probably important. Um, and for weight itself, these are actually really interesting. This was the thesis of Gary Taub's book, but basically obesity does not track with affluence. There are plenty of poor, impoverished, and laboring countries eating welfare food that have demonstrated very high rates of obesity. This particular paper is by McCarthy from 1966, and he observes uh, obese subjects that are eating less than 2,000 calories a day, and actually eating fewer calories uh, than the control subjects that were lean. They had about the same amount of physical exertion every day, and these are, these are poor, impoverished people. They're not driving around in cars and playing video games in 1960. And Basically, they observed that the only thing that they could, they could, the difference that they could observe was the uh, amount of carbohydrate in the diet. And this is from the 1960s, before we made these low-fat recommendations. But they said that the, the proportion of carbohydrate was 10 to 15 percent higher, and fat calories 10 to 15 percent lower than usually found in the 19 in the United States population studies. And then they did resemble another group that also had obesity. Um, and then you kind of have the practical side of this. Uh, we kind of told everyone a long time ago and can kind of continue to tell them that laziness is the problem and gluttony is the problem. Um, everyone now has a membership to Soul Cycle, and health clubs have exploded, and high-intensity interval training was invented, and people exercise all the time. And in the 1950s, when obesity rates were about a third of what they were today, doctors actually advised against exercise because they thought it was stressful on the body, and gyms were relatively rare. The 2000s food pyramid didn't even have food in it. It literally just had steps. You know, that's the level that we're going to try and convey to people. We've kind of done all we can do to advocate for this framework. You kind of have to ask, well, what's the result after we tell this to people? And it's this, right? That's, that's what we get. Um, and at a certain point, I don't know, there's a, there's a bullshitism that people invoke, which is, well, if we hadn't done this, it would have been a lot worse or something like that. It's kind of an ad hoc hypothesis with no basis in fact or justification. But 
you really have to kind of watch logical fallacies. But the, to their credit, kind of the public health community observes that the compliance with these recommendations are, are poor. Um, they kind of refuse to admit the possibility that the compliance is a result of bad recommendations that are hard to follow. Uh, kind of an example is this, if I'm hungry and I, I wanna follow the USDA food guide pyramid, what do I eat? Like which foods are approved? Um, so even though kind of the vegan push is in full swing, they've kind of maybe tacitly approved a uh, lean, dry chicken breast. Um, but, you know, really we need to be vegan, so it's tofu, right? Um, and then fat's bad, sugar's bad, and, you know, steak will just put you in the grave, so eggs have cholesterol. What do you, like, what's left? What, what is actually allowable? I guess we get quinoa, and I think they also approve probably like a low-fat, no-sugar added yogurt. And... You know, and that's it. That's that's kind of what they allow. And then for everything else, they use the word moderation and let you kind of figure out how much a moderate amount of chocolate cake is. And for me, it's the whole thing. And to be moderate, I cut it in half and I save the other half for the next morning. You know what I mean? That's, and then they say like people don't adhere. And it's like, I wonder why. Like maybe the diet you recommend is unpalatable and unsatisfying. Perhaps if people constantly try to make themselves hungry, it's going to result in binge eating and snacking on garbage. You know, perhaps people who are deprived of meat and fat will inevitably eat sugar. You know, I just know from experience that I ate this way and I, I tried to eat this way and I ended up kind of hangry all the time and I ended up indulging in garbage in between meals. Um, that's how I felt. And so the kind of retort of like, well, if people did comply, they would be healthy is not really relevant if they can't based upon any reasonable advocacy. So th the real question you have to ask is like, what else can we try? Like what else is available? Are there any other hypotheses? And I've surely alluded that I have one that I think is a little simpler and simpler hypotheses are, are kind of good. Basically, the idea is that it, it's more to do with the food quality than the food quantity. And if we focus on food quality, we can um, understand this problem a bit better. Um, I think the easiest way to kind of explain this is with the animal husbandry analogy. I don't know how many of you are. My grandfather's from farm country, so he'd talk to me about cows a lot. But this is my cow, Jill, and I put her in a pasture. And she kind of grows up nice and healthy and strong, and she attains a certain weight. But the key thing is, like, for my steaks, I really like fatty ribeyes. Like, right, I want to turn Jill into this waggy beef. <laughs> um, how do I make Jill fat? And if I go ahead and I truck that much hay into the pasture, uh, it turns out that Jill doesn't really get that much fatter. Like, she doesn't appear to gain that much weight. Um, she can't be tempted into the sin of gluttony, but I need my fatty ribeye, and what's the solution? And the interesting thing is that we actually switch the type of food we're giving the cow. Instead of giving them roughage, like they're kind of designed to eat, we give them corner grain, and Jill fattens right up this. Um, did Jill suddenly get lazy? Did Jill's moral character fail her? Uh, no, it was purely a function of the type of food that Jill was eating. And if we want Jill to get less fat and sick, we remove the food that is wrong and Jill slims right down or we just, you know, eat the ribeye. But as it turns out, if we kind of apply this model outwards, we, we look at just about any animal anywhere, we see that all these animals in the wild are able to maintain a healthy weight with markedly little variation, despite massive changes in food availability and energy uh, requirements. This is a paper talking about the, the impacts on the, the lifestyle patterns of lions as droughts come in throughout Africa and how much more they walk. They put GPS collars on them and, and we're tracking how far they walked to get food on a, on a given day. But the, the popular explanation for this is called the, the thrifty gene hypothesis. It basically says that every animal, especially humans, are hardwired to get fat anytime there is more, like we need, in order to maintain a healthy weight, we need barely enough food at any given point in time. Um, but that hypothesis implies a constant lack of food, and it, it can't really explain, like the evidence can't explain it. Um, that the lion sometimes struggles to get food and sometimes has bountiful prey, like during a drought, all the antelope crowd around the water and go, like it, it doesn't feel right intuitively. And kind of what it implies is that there's probably a more sophisticated system than we give credit for that's regulating a lot of these things with homeostasis. Like you know that your blood glucose and all these different measurements are homeostatic. You don't accidentally get up to 110 degrees because you exercised. There's, there's mechanisms trying to make sure you stay in balance. Um, and the accuracy of these mechanisms is actually crazy to think about because over the course of a decade or so, if you have a typical you know, human total daily energy expenditure of 2,600 calories, that's 9 million calories that you eat. And assuming you, you are actually able to maintain your weight without any conscious effort, like a lot of these animals are able to do, one pound over, over you know, a decade is something like one calorie per day, or about 0.04% accuracy. Um, I'll shamelessly admit to stealing this from Kit, but the thrifty gene idea should really be called the supreme coincidence hypothesis, in that for all time, Every animal has always been threading the needle on the amount of energy availability such to maintain a constant weight, and it's only humans that have ever violated that, that principle. But as we know, like, 
some animals have problems. Like sometimes this system breaks. Um, basically us and everything we feed, like animals in a zoo, like you'll never see a tiger like that in the wild. They don't exist. Um, and for people that don't believe me, like there's an Australian zoo that actually had to remove fruit from their, um, from their animal's diet because of the drastic increase in obesity and tooth decay that was identified. And I don't know if you've seen like the changes in a fruit over a period of time. This is what a watermelon used to look like. This is what it looks like now. Um, that's not like more vitamin C, right? That's, that's more sugar. That's what we're doing to it. That's what we want. And so it leads to this hypothesis that some of the foods that we eat are just incompatible with our physiology. Um, and they cause insulin resistance and chronic disease and all these related downstream problems. And if you can fix this problem, the metabolic syndrome will improve to some extent without any kind of conscious effort to like obsess over how much you're eating or be hungry. And, and if we eat right, the body will take care of most of these things without our conscious effort, which I think sounds really appealing to me, right? Um, at a high level, we've kind of made the following changes to our foods. Um, we eat a lot more of these, uh, which are basically solvent extracted oils. Prior to the early 1900s, we couldn't eat these because they were actually toxic. We had to learn how to detoxify cottonseed oil. It was Prior to that, it was an industrial waste or they used it as a lubricant in machines. But once they figured out how to do that and then they found out about hydrogenation, lo and behold, Crisco became a thing. But uh, we also, the amount of sugar we've eaten has also increased relatively substantially. And some of that has to do with the decrease in cost now that we have multiple different sweeteners like high fructose corn syrup. And then the other thing is uh, white flour and particularly very highly refined white flour. Um, and you kind of know these as these types of foods, like walk into a convenience store and like look, and almost everything that you see is going to be this, some of those three basic building blocks. Um, and a common refrain is that it's the lack of nutritional value of these foods that causes the problem, which is kind of very ambiguous and doesn't sit well with me because, you know, we can add vitamin C into the Dorito that doesn't make the Dorito healthy. And I think people would understand that intuitively. That doesn't make any sense. But um, there's probably more complex and subtle reasons why this is bad or even a chronic toxin. And yes, in case you're wondering, salad dressing is almost entirely like vegetable oil. It made me a little sad when I discovered that. Um, and the question is, therefore, if you try to undo all these changes, like you take the big hammer and you try to cut out absolutely everything that you can possibly think of and do an extreme elimination diet, what happens? And this was actually just published on Wednesday. This is the long-term two-year follow-up from Virta Health. Um, and they Basically, over a two-year period, they put people on a very strict elimination diet, and they were able to essentially reverse diabetes and reduce the amount of uh, medication better than any other intervention that's been tried, including these uh, invasive stomach removal, gastric bypass surgeries. Um, there are kind of two routes you can go to this elimination diet. Um, I probably explained which one I fit into at this point, but... Uh, they're both invoked to some extent. And really, I think the, the key unifying theme here is, is a whole foods idea. Um, it's the idea that you want to exclude pretty much everything packaged and franken looking. One of the key problems in a, uh, in a vegan diet is that Oreos are vegan. So it doesn't necessarily, that's why we call it a whole foods. And both of these have that problem. So you just have to be a little careful. But they both remove kind of the refined flour and sugar and all that kind of processed stuff. Um, some vegan diets implementations allow wheat flours. Uh, the ketogenic diet typically excludes oils. A lot of the uh, the vegan diets typically do too. A lot of them recommend that you don't eat, eat uh, refined or processed oils. Um, the major difference is kind of this, uh, basically this meat versus starch trade-off. So the ketogenic diet oftentimes will be based on meat and animal products, whereas the vegan diet excludes them almost entirely. It's probably not the biggest difference in the grand scheme of things. I know what I believe. But uh, I think that there are some concerns about nutritional completeness if you go on a purely plant-based diet, because historically we've been hunter-gatherer, scavenger, not uh, purely, purely herbivores. So the, uh, there are some nutrient deficiencies that can develop. But in general, I think the major change here is cutting out the problem as opposed to uh, which hypothesis you go with. And obviously, like, the, these are the kind of questions we want to ask, right? We want to, we want to distill it down. Um, and unfortunately, I can't answer this question. And I think anyone who tries to answer this question, like, can a ketogenic diet improve your lifespan and all these hard endpoints? And we, we, we don't have enough data to say so at this point. Um, I know that I'm like, it's promising. Like, I know that we have strong data that, you know, certain diseases can be treated. I know that we have um, improvements in insulin and we know that we track insulin associationally. But, you know, you, you got to be careful when you synthesize things. I think at this point in time, cautious optimism is appropriate here, but it's going to require... Uh, future research to, to pin it down. Um, but in general, I think it's probably safe to say that people undervalue 
good nutrition in terms of health and probably would be surprised by how much better one might feel by eating better um, and excluding the food-like substances. I think that would tend to surprise a lot of people. I think we tend to de-emphasize that in favor of like the moderation idea. Um, there are some known benefits to a ketogenic diet. Um, it's been used to treat epilepsy for about 100 years in uh, various hospitals around the United States. Uh, it's also, I think, shown pretty promising results in weight management, mild cognitive impairment, diabetes. And there's ongoing research on some more of these topics, and it remains to be seen. Um, the interesting thing is uh, the re there's a recent drug class called PI3 kinase inhibitors, and it was actually developed based upon the understanding that uh, a lot of the mutations that cluster around certain cancers cluster around the insulin signaling pathway. So it's more evidence suggesting that there's there's a story to be told here. Um, but, and I do have to touch on the environmental impact of diets because that's been really big in Seattle over the past few, few months. But um, first thing you have to say about environmental impact of a diet is that it's a completely distinct conversation from nutrition. And you cannot, you can talk about one or you can talk about the other, but you, they're not the same, right? Your body doesn't care about the greenhouse house gas emissions of any particular food when it decides how healthy you're gonna be. It's not a consideration that your body has, is privy to. Um, if the goals are opposed, you have a compromise to make, right? Um, and there's a bit of a logical fallacy that says, okay, if we can't produce enough meat for everyone, therefore we should not eat meat, which is a perfectly reasonable solution to that problem would be an improvement in meat production. Uh, we wouldn't suggest you throw out your iPhone if we don't have one for everyone in Africa, you know what I mean? Um, and when it comes to the environment, you need to be pretty careful to do your homework because there are a lot of unhelpful simplifications and downright falsehoods. It turns out that animal husbandry is a really great agricultural model one of the key concerns is that we need a lot of calories as our population grows, and cows actually convert grass, which we cannot eat, into a digestible and a nutritionally complete source of fat and protein. Um, you actually cannot eliminate ruminants from the agricultural system because they're responsible for consuming a lot of the waste products which are produced during other forms of plant agriculture, like soybean leaves and things, so they're actually a net calorie gain. Um, and this is actually a completely self-contained uh, ecosystem. So you actually don't have to do anything to this. The cows will run and the rain will move. The grassland ecosystem is actually involved in a symbiotic fashion with ruminants. So you, you can't really remove them. This, this is what happens on the left here. This is what happens when you actively graze and actively manage a pasture. And on the right, this is what happens when the ruminants are removed. It's called desertification. And it's what happens when ruminants are removed. And uh, the amount of ruminants that we have today, they think is at par or maybe less than what would have been found on the Great Plains during the 1500s um, because there were a lot more herds of uh, buffalo, although the, the exact numbers aren't totally understood. But And my friend noted that there's kind of a very strong vegan push right now um, in the nutritional community. And it concerns me a little bit because it sacrifices the nutritional quality of the diet in the name of various other motivations. Um, this, is a, this is a nutritious food but some people will actually get angry at me when I tell you how many vitamins are in the fat and meat, right? They'll actually have a visceral reaction to that. Um, the story behind it is a bit interesting. Um, the main force behind vegan diets collectively in the United States is called the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They have a variety of reasons for this, but the members preach vegetarian and vegan diets as a matter of religious faith. They actually do not declare this as a conflict of interest, and one of them is on the 2020 USDA Dietary Guidelines Group, and he, uh, this is an excerpt from an article on him. Um, but uh, the Seventh-day Adventists also founded um, the American Dietetics Association and a number of the medical schools that practice under their faith. Um, John Harvey Kellogg, the cornflakes man, was actually a Seventh-day Adventist as well. And he worked on concocting food products that were bland and vegetarian. And his actual stated purpose was to diminish the libido and desire of kids to masturbate. And it is true, some vegans actually do find diminished or absent libido, which is kind of a salient indication that your body has decided kids are not appropriate right now. Uh, and Seventh-day Adventist presence is just very strong in the dietetics community as a result of their religious conviction. And um, unfortunately, there's no like counteracting force. I was saying I should form the Church of the Flying Ribeye or something to like counteract them. But um, the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church actually owns the largest cereal producer in Australia. And it's actually all their profit is given back to the church tax-free. Um, and they are all interconnected within the health, the nutrition, and the uh, grain produ production industry. Um, and the origin of the idea that meat caused cancer was actually a divine vision in the 1860s to a Seventh-day Adventist woman who then uh, has spawned like 150 years of regression analyses to try and show that meat caused cancer. Um, so I, just closing personally, I, I felt the kind of improvement eating this way that if someone told me conclusively that if you eat this way that I'm going to die 10 years younger, I would say, okay, that's fine. I'm going to be happy and I'm going to be healthy and I'm going to die 10 years younger. You know, it's, it's that point for me in the, just the terms of the, the 
changes that I've noticed in my own health and my own happiness and my own energy levels. And, um, you know, I don't exactly remember what I was doing beforehand because it's been a while, but I did kind of fall off the bus in, in 2017. You know, I've managed to convince many friends and family to kind of join with me. Um, uh, some have found great success, some have struggled. Um, the two biggest hurdles in my experience have been addiction to food and uh, uh, the changing of the palate. Like it took me a long time to be able to switch from enjoying the foods I'd previously eaten to switch uh, to, to enjoy the modern ones. Um, the other thing I noticed, I look healthier. I don't know if like, I think that uh, one of the great subterfuges of the late 20th century was this idea that we should, uh, should ignore, or, or there should be a distinction between the outwardly visible health of someone and the, the internal health. The idea that you should accept feeling like garbage and impotent on a low fat diet because the trustworthy Harvard School of Public Health professor Walter Willett promises you it'll pay off in the long run, you know what I mean? And it's this kind of interesting thing where I could I could see my mom back east after a while of not seeing me and she said, oh my God, you look healthier than you've been in years. And then she discovers I've been eating bacon and she's like, oh my God, you're gonna die. It's just an interesting reaction. Um, I, I think this is kind of the product of the the panic associated with the heart disease epidemic in the mid 20th century and not knowing where it was coming from and, and kind of finding it to be a mysterious killer. I mean, at that point they were also smoking probably a pack of cigarettes a day each, but um, you know, we've pretty much ruled out steak as a cause of heart disease. Um, if I were a betting man, I would wager that not smoking and uh, not having this metabolic dysfunction and eating whole foods would probably put you in a pretty good spot to not have heart disease. And I think we need to pay a bit more attention to our outward facing health. I know this is a little bit childish of me, but these are some popular vegan doctors and their age progression over about six years. And I think that like some of these things are a lot more outwardly visible than um, you would expect. And these are things that I think we ought to pay more attention to how we look and how we feel. Um, and I'm a suspicious guy, you know, I understand that there's placebo effect and everything. I, I would always advocate that you don't take me at my word and you do your own research and you, you uh, apply an experimental approach to this to see what works for you. I think that's what I did, that's how I got here. And I think that that's kind of the most appropriate path for you to take. So I hope that's some food for thought. Um, basically the implementation of this diet is accomplished via a food list. If you're doing keto and there are various like tiers that people will add in. Uh, the full keto, well starting like the, the core foods that are present in carnivore would be meat, water, and you can have three different waters. It's hot, cold, and carbonated. You can have salt and you can have eggs. Um, a lot of people, honestly, the people who tend to eat that way are people with severe autoimmune problems. And they're actually people who, who experience that like they actually cannot deviate from this without causing horrific autoimmune symptoms. And these are things we don't really understand. And it's again, why it's very important to understand how you feel on these things and try different things out. And then some people will eat zero carb, which adds dairy, spices, coffee, tea, maybe 90% dark chocolate. And then like a full ketogenic diet would add in a lot of other things that people normally associate with a more balanced diet, like leafy green vegetables, low starch vegetables, nuts in limited quantities, berries sometimes, avocados. And, and people will try to limit the amount of carbohydrate they eat just because if you're diabetic, you need to uh, limit that way. And the one thing, I, you gotta be careful sometimes because there's a lot of garbage that tries to get sold and you know people will try to, to pile on to this, uh, this idea, so. Don't eat that stuff. Anyways, any uh, questions? Thank you for your time. I know that I've uh, I say a lot very quickly. So, and I thank you guys all for like making the time to come out.